Okay, so um, so let's go back. So so last time, last time, we proved uh, the Poisson summation formula. Poisson summation, which says if you have a nice function, so if f is a nice function, let's say on the reals, nice decay properties, then uh, if you add up its values over the integers and you add up its values over its spectrum. This is M in the spectrum of the Euclidean Laplacian, two derivatives in X, acting on L2 of G mod gamma, where G is just the reals and gamma is just the integers. And um, I'm gonna try to be a little careful about uh, I'm going to try to set it up in a way so that when you see this for real, uh, it looks basically the same. So there's a there's a group, there's a, there's a subgroup, discrete subgroup of in this case finite covolume, in fact a compact co-compact group Z, the circle R mod Z, G mod gamma is compact, um, and the spectrum is the eigenvalues with multiplicity. So that's what this M, but this really secretly is just Z uh, of the Fourier transform. So that's so that's what we proved last time. Now um, I was running out of time, and what I should have done is just stopped instead of trying to finish the proof. But um, as a result, there were a number of key features that I just raced through that I want to highlight. So let's let's talk about the the trace formula proof just one more time, so that it's a little bit more. Um, so that, again, when you see the the real thing, uh, those salient features are. Uh, familiar. Okay, so so again, so review the proof. Review of the proof. We started with making a point pair invariant. Invariant k of x y with the property that k of x y is equal to k of x plus u y plus u for all you are. And how did we make such a thing? So this action, I'm gonna to try to pretend that uh, R, the addition operation on the reals is not abelian so that I don't, uh, so that we see why these things will work in general. Okay, so, so this is a right action, even though it doesn't matter, everything's abelian. This, uh, this translation is a right, right action. Okay, whereas the group operation is a left action. Okay, so this translation, we sort of, we're sort of using the right representation, uh, the right, so we have the right regular representation, right regular representation, pi of u acting on a function at x is f of x plus u. Okay, so this is, this is just the rep representation from let's say L2 on R to L2 on R or uh, more generally. Okay, so how do we make uh, a point pair invariant out of this fixed text test function F? We do F of, let's do it like this, negative X plus one. Okay, so then, so the inverse, so this is X inverse multiplied on the left by Y. And of course you have to check that when you replace X by, so, if you replace x by x plus u, and you replace y by y plus u, huh, I've already done it backwards, have I? Um, this is how I wanted it. This will reverse them. So is it not like u plus y? No, I guess oh, I want yeah. y minus x. Oh. I guess I want y minus x. Y minus x. Okay, good. That'll fix everything. So. I'm trying to make it non-abelian and it's so hard to make the reals not abelian. Okay, so y gets replaced by y plus u and x gets replaced by x plus u. But of course, inversion is an anti-automorphism. And so negative x plus u is not negative x minus u. We learned the distributive property wrong. It's, uh, it's negative u minus x because that's what uh, the group operation 
uh, does what the inversion does to the group operation. And now we have a u minus u in the middle. So of course these two cancel. Okay, so that's why this is a point pair invariant. So I wanted to try to highlight some of, some of these uh, subtleties. Okay, then we automorphized it. Any questions on this? So far so good. We automorphized to big K of x y by summing over ha. Huh, can I write gamma in gamma, which really means n in z, uh, little k of the action is of the group is on the left. So gamma plus x comma y. Okay, so this is a function on uh, two copies of gamma. And we talked about why it's also invariant in the second variable, even though we didn't automatically make it so. Okay. Wait, and now why I'm would you call this? Sorry. Oh. oh, why would you call this automorphize again? Like this. So part? now it's automorphic. Now it's invariant under gamma. Oh, okay. So make it invariant. So this is just a function on the reals. This is real variables. Um, this is a uh, invariant under gamma. Invariant. Right, so sort of like automorphic in the same way that you talk about, say, a modular form. Or exactly. Something. Exactly. Okay. You change your function by by gamma. It doesn't change the value of the function. So auto more same maps into itself, uh, invariant under this this action of this discrete group. Yeah, I'm realizing what I really wanted to do instead of changing this is I want in this uh, here I want the left action. Here, what I really want is that it's invariant under any translation. The the group can act on itself either on the right or on the left. And so here, what I really wanted, uh, I won't change it too much, but really what I wanted was u plus x u plus y, and that it's invariant under any of this action, and then negative x plus y will work for exactly this reason, but the right way around. It doesn't, it doesn't actually matter, and you'll see when you get to the real thing uh, which way it goes. Okay, so we've, we automorphize this thing, and then we, uh, we made this kernel, so this we treat as a kernel, and we made a, uh, an, um, a Hilbert-Schmidt operator. So make what's called a Hilbert-Schmidt operator. It's just a name. If you've never heard of Hilbert-Schmidt operators, this is it. This is what they are. OK, so we're going to make a Hilbert-Schmidt operator out of this kernel. Um, these are just words. So you don't need to, I'm going to explain what all these things are. But so that when you see them, if you're studying uh, function analysis or something. So this is a Hilbert-Schmidt operator. Uh, this function is treated as a, hernal, as a kernel. So you have uh, this action on, on your Hilbert space. The Hilbert space is L2 of G mod gamma. Uh, what's the action? What does it do to a function? We saw this last time. It's the integral over the space G mod gamma, G of a dummy variable, K of this intertwining the two variables, X, Y, with respect to Haar measure on the, on the quotient. OK. So this is the, the kernel that you make your integral operator out of. Fine. And then the final step of the, uh, the, this baby trace formula is to compute the trace. Compute the trace of i in two ways. Geometrically and spectrally. OK. And again, what is the trace? is uh, it's the sum of the diagonal entries, right? So it's the integral over the space of k, x, x, dx. When we did this geometrically, uh, it just means open up the definition, follow the geometry. The geometry got us a sum over, now I'll switch to our standard notation, n and n, f of n times the covolume, which is one. Okay, so that was all, uh, that part I didn't rush. It was the spectral resolution that, uh, that I went over and saw that the clock was ticking. So went straight to computation. But there's a lot of things that we don't need to compute. There are things, what I want to emphasize is that, that there are things that uh, for, are true for basic principles. So I want to highlight those principles. OK. So, um, to com so for, the, uh, for the spectral expansion, for the spectral expansion, let's redo the spectral expansion. Now that we have time. 
Okay. For the spectral expansion, what I want to observe, first of all, again, we have this operator, the Laplacian, the Euclidean Laplacian. Um, we have a Hilbert space. What's the Hilbert space? L2 R mod Z, G mod gamma, with an inner product. Of course, Hilbert spaces come with, with an inner product. Uh, what's the pairing? If I have two vectors, let's see, should I call them V and W now instead of F and G? Since F is my fixed thing, I'll call them V and W. So if I have two functions on the circle, V and W, then their pairing is just the integral over the circle, V of X, W of X bar, DX, okay? So this is like the most basic Hilbert space you can possibly have. And, uh, and uh, the Laplacian is self-adjoint with respect to this pairing. In other words, if I apply the Laplacian to V, did we talk about this last time? I think we did. Did we mention it? No, don't remember. Okay, so self-adjoint uh, means that if I move the delta to the other side, I get the same thing. So as a matrix, you can think of it as being its own transpose. When you move, uh, when you interpret this as uh, delta being a matrix, it's that its transpose moves over. But all this is, I mean, this is something very simple. This is uh, integration by parts twice. So if I have two derivatives applying uh, to V, I can apply integration by parts, so partial integration, um, there is no boundary term. I'm going to integrate this side, differentiate this side. So this is the negative dx v dx w, which, by the way, is why it's a definite uh, operator. I'll, I'll come back to that in, in just a second. And then if I integrate by parts again, then uh, I move this dx over to here and put in another minus sign. So this is uh, d two derivatives in w, which is exactly that. Okay, because because it's second order, you have this. So one derivative is not self-adjoint. It comes with a minus sign if you want to move it over. But two derivatives is self-adjoint. Does it have an initial name when it has a minus sign? Um, when it has a conjugate, it, it's, uh, you know, Hermitian or something. But uh, no, when it has a minus sign, it's like, I don't know, anti-self-adjoint or something. We can make up a name. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, like skew symmetric or something? Yeah, um, skew symmetric. Uh, Maybe it's a bit different. Yeah, skew symmetric is a is a bit different. Those are all things. So so skew symmetric and, and Hermitian. These are all. Um, oh, is it skew symmetric? Is it anyway, is that joint. So skew symmetric is when your transpose is a negative, right? When your transpose is the negative. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Okay, so Lewis, you're right. So one derivative is skew symmetric and two derivatives is fully self-adjoint. Thanks. Okay. Um, right. So delta is self-adjoint. I claim that uh, the integral operator is also self-adjoint. So why is that? You were maybe so also going to say that it shows that it's a definite operator, right? Yes, thank you. I was going to say that it's a definite operator. So why is it a definite operator? Also definite. Means it only takes, its eigenvalues are only positive or negative. So because it's self-adjoint, if you have a, a symmetric matrix, its eigenvalues are real. But now not only are they real, they only take one sign, positive or negative, depending on how you define your Laplacian. I guess mine is going to be negative definite. Also, uh, definite operator. Uh, it's also a definite operator. Why? Well, if uh, delta V is lambda V, if I have an eigenvalue, then uh, the inner product of delta V with V is, well, it's, I, I already said this is lambda. So this is lambda times VV. On the other hand, when I do one different, one integration by parts, I get negative dx v dx v. And this is the L2 norm of the derivative. And L2 norms are non-negative. So this is non-positive. In other words, the eigenvalue is non-positive. Okay, so that's the, the this, so this is uh, positive, this is negative semi-definite. 
might be zero. Okay, really semi-definite. So why why do we want it to be definite? Um, we, at the moment, we don't really care, but uh, much later we'll see the usefulness of having definite operators. That there's a that there's a bottom of the spectrum. There's a bottom to the spectrum, and then everything else is to one side. There's not spectrum on both sides of the of the constant. And actually, we already knew this because we know all of the we know the full spectral re resolution, right? Uh, we already know all eigenvalues. Uh, the eigenfunction, so this so our Hilbert space decomposes as a direct uh, sum of these eigenfunctions, em. But I want to I want to not uh, I want to try to do as little as possible, knowing explicitly what the eigenfunctions are. Uh, we know all the eigenfunctions, in fact, and what are their eigenvalues? So two derivatives. We already computed this. Uh, uh, two pi i m comes down twice, so I get a negative four pi squared m squared which of course is negative, except when it's zero. Okay, why is the integral operator self-adjoint? Well, we have to open up what it is. What is the integral operator? So what is this inner product? It's an integral over G mod gamma of the integral operator on V times W of X dx. And what is the integral operator of V? It's the integral over G mod gamma V of Y K of xy dy. I guess I want a, a bar somewhere. Okay, but our, our function was real valued. Our function that we started this whole game with was real valued. And uh, since our function is real valued, this is also equal to k bar. And then I can reverse orders, and you and it's clear that this is the same thing as uh, v i w. Okay, so the integral operator is self-adjoint. The Laplace operator is self-adjoint. And one more fact: somebody I'm sure knows what the next thing I'm going to say is. You have two self-adjoint operators acting on the same space. It would be very nice if they did. Can they commuted. Commuted. Right. So yeah. the next fact is that uh, these things, this and this, commute. And there's a very basic reason why they do. Differentiation is a right action, whereas uh, the group action that we use to define this automorphic kernel is a left action. So they never see each other. So let's see that in in practice. So let's. Uh, so this is a claim. And how can we see that? So what is, so first of all, not only do these commute, but actually uh, dx and i, let's see, do they commute or do they anti-commute or skew commute? Uh, let's see, let's see what happens with dx and i. So what, so what is dx acting on i of a vector? Let's call it uh, g at a number. Uh, X or something. <laughs> nice, skew mute. I like it. I like it. So, so this is this is not the same X, right? This is the symbol differentiation in the variable, and this is the variable. So, so what does this mean? Well, what is d dx? Uh, uh, dx. It's uh, it's the limit as h goes to zero, one over h. And then translation by h, right? So this is i of g of x plus h, which of course is again the limit one over h. I, what is i? It's the integral over g mod gamma, g of y, k of x y dy, but x is now x plus h. Yeah, so I do want this. Uh, I'm getting something a little bit. I'm getting something a little bit backwards. Anyway, um, so because this is a point pair invariant, uh, I should I can subtract h from both sides. So it's it's um, 
Yeah, I have to be a little bit more careful than, than I'm being. Okay, good thing we're abelian so that I don't have to deal with any of this. Um, so I have this h, uh, x plus h here, but of course I can move that to the y variable. So now I have y minus h, and now I can make a change of variables. y goes to y plus h. This is Haar measure, it's invariant. That kills the minus h there and puts a plus h here. And then I just move the limit inside. Of course, I'm assuming everything is nice so that uh, you can interchange limits and integrals, nicely decaying and so on. So I have a limit one over h, g of y plus h times k of xy dy, which is of course i of dg. They needed something you don't like? I am a little bit confused. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something, but when we take the definition of the derivative, sooner we have minus i gx. Minus i gx? We're here? Yeah, yeah. So this is ig, this is one function. And I want to differentiate that function and evaluate that at the point x. Ah, uh, oh. So here's the function ig. But instead of x, I'm going to wiggle x, x plus h, and then divide by, by h and take the limit. Yeah, but don't you have to subtract the igx? I'm sorry, of course I like do. Like difference, of difference course I quotient? Do. Of course I do. Da, da, da. IG of x. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Thank makes you. sense. Thank you. And then when I do that on both sides, you'll see, OK, so minus igx. And this will have only g of y for the same reason that that's what igx is. Thank you. What I mean is, anyway, it's clear. When you wiggle this value, uh, I guess I meant, uh, anyway, OK, it's clear. Thank you. Thanks for fixing that. All right, so these, in fact, commute, not skew mute or whatever we were. I like that word, actually. Um, so these, uh, so one derivative commutes, so of course two derivatives commute. This is in the center of the universal enveloping algebra. Well, uh, you'll hear those words. All that means is uh, it's, a, it's a nice differential operator that behaves well with these um, integral operators. And if you have two self-adjoint operators that, that commute, uh, then you can simultaneously, diag if, you can, if you can diagonalize them on finite dimensional vector spaces, you can, in general you can. But if you can diagonalize them, then they uh, then they have a simultaneous eigenbasis. But since delta has an orthonormal basis, already has an orthonormal basis, orthonormal basis, uh, um, I also has the same basis. Is also is also uh, normal uh, is also orthogonal. In fact, orthonormal orthonormalized, orthonormalized by the same. This is sort of similar to like HECA operators. Exactly, you know. exactly. We're gonna, yep, we're making our way there. So um, this is why I wanna highlight these things. So, um, right, but we know what the eigenvalues, so the eigenvalues of these EMs, we already said, these, uh, I'll just call it lambda M, EM, this uh, negative four pi squared m squared or whatever, uh, the i's might have different eigenvalues. There's no reason they have the same eigenvalues. Okay, so i e m. So we want to work out what i e m is. Okay. So this is some other eigenvalue uh, mu m. And so what is mu m? Well, that's exactly the computation we did last time. And um, the trick here is that you don't actually need to know any longer that this is an, I, that this is an element of, um, so there's a trick here, which is not such a useful trick in this setting, but it, but it will be in the real trace formula. Uh, no longer, no longer need to know that em is in L2 can take any eigenfunction 
of delta uh, in L2 of G mod gamma can take uh, can take an eigenfunction of delta on uh, on G with the same eigenvalue. To compute, to compute this this eigenvalue mu. Okay. Uh oh, did I did I cut cut out there? No. Okay. I'm getting paranoid now. All right. So what is this eigenvalue? What is this eigenvalue of the um, of the integral operator? Uh, this is what we computed last time. We can do it again in in a second. So this is equal to the integral of g mod gamma. Um, e m of y k x y d y we unfold we open this up right so the point is instead of we don't know what e m is but we know of another eigenfunction that has the same eigenvalue uh, in this case it's the function e m y so uh, this is this is what I'm it's it's hard to distinct they're the same thing in this case. But in the general case, you'll see how it's useful to be able to stick any function in here to, to determine these uh, mu eigenvalues. Um, all right, maybe I'm belaboring a point that I shouldn't be. So, uh, so this is what we did last time. You unfold this integral. This is now an integral over g, e, m, y, little k, x, y, dy. And then uh, if we open this up, um, Let's see, I unfolded with respect to the x variable. All right, should we do it slowly? Uh, we did this last time. We did this last time and what we got was f hat of m, e of mx. Okay, so the point is that the e, and this is itself e m. So, so uh, this is itself e sub m. So what is this eigenvalue? This mu m eigenvalue is exactly the Fourier transform of m. So that's the interpretation of that of that Fourier transform. It is the sum of the eigenvalues. That's why on the other side of Poisson summation formula, you have the sum of the eigenvalues of what? Of this integral operator. We took the trace of this operator. We computed it geometrically. Now we're computing it spectrally. And it's literally the sum of its eigenvalues. That's the, that's the point I wanted to make. OK, and from there, we conclude uh, that the geometric side adds up to the spectral side. By, com by completing the computation, by taking this uh, you know, uh, k of xx integral, wherever it was, this expanding this spectrally and uh, integrating out all of the ENs. So the rest of the proof is exactly how we did it last time. I just wanted to, to highlight exactly this point that the this is literally the trace. It's the sum of the eigenvalues of what of this integral operator. This is sum of eigenvalues explicitly of this integral operator. What is the next instance we're going to be using this procedure? Uh, so hopefully uh, most of you are going to Henrik's course where he's doing the trace formula, I think on, on GL2, if not more generally, I don't know, Lewis, uh, if you know what, what he's covering, but so I don't think I will do more than uh, touch the trace formula here. But um, when you do the real trace formula, it's exactly this. It's, it's much more complicated. The geometric side is much more complicated. Uh, you have to, yeah, if, there, if it's not compact, then it's actually a limiting argument. You have to cut off the, the non-compact part. Uh, but yeah, sort of if you, so the next order of business is to do this with G equals SL2R and gamma is SL2C, for example. Yeah, so I think he's mostly staying in the context of GL2, so uh -huh. working his way up to the Salberg trace formula. Great, great. Um, I had a question about that actually. So Please. the geometric side in that context is like over closed geodesics or something. Well, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's an integral over. In fact, you can almost do it. I tried to keep the notation so that 
when you go, I think, to do it in Henrik's course, it'll be literally the same thing, except when we go to evaluate this uh, geometric side, Selberg observed that there's a good way of doing it. So what I skipped this time, because what we did it uh, pretty much completely last time is this computation. And here, everything turned out to be the same, but um, in the, the real one, first of all, this, this integral is infinite. The trace in, uh, if you actually take the trace of the operator in uh, for SL2R minus SLTZ, that's in infinite. So what you have to do is take a, a truncated trace, you truncate it some height y, and then you work out what the asymptotic formula is as y goes to infinity. And what you get is, um, so for uh, SL2R mod SL2Z, uh, the trace of this truncated kernel turns out to be growing something like uh, a constant times log y plus a lower order term, let's call it T1, plus uh, a smaller contribution on the geometric side. On the spectral side, you get exactly the same thing, some constant A log Y plus something else, plus lower order terms. And so this, inside this lower order place is where you pick up the trace formula. So, so it's much more complicated. Yeah, it's fantastic though, that's great. Yeah, but it's a beautiful argument, yeah. Um, so, but in this case, is there, so you talked about like sum of diagonal entries basically, right? Is there a way to think about that geometrically? Well, that's exactly what this is. This is, if I'm thinking of K, you know, I is, I is some matrix, right? What do you do if I, what do, K is like the matrix coefficients of, of the matrix I. Yeah. Right? right. What do you do when a matrix acts on a vector? You take all of its entries and you multiply and the, the, uh, the X entry is the sum over the Y, uh, over the columns of uh, the, the IJ entry times the Jth entry of the vector that you're multiplying. Uh -huh. So this is literally, uh, these are literally the diagonal entries of the matrix I. So, but in what sense is that geometry, right? Oh, geometric just in the sense that there's two ways to compute the trace. One is the geometry of the matrix. The geometry of the matrix is that it has a diagonal. Huh. And then there's the I guess of the, the matrix that has in the, Selberg, in the Selberg trace formula, I think of it more as like a space with, you know, curves in it or something like that. Well, that's what the, that's the other reason it might be called a ge geometric side is that uh -huh. to do this evaluation, you decompose uh -huh. when, you, when you have this sum, you realize that this sum, which at first is over all gamma and gamma, uh -huh. uh, actually has the same value if gammas are in the same conjugacy class. So you should, you should uh, life becomes much easier when you group these gammas by conjugacy classes. Uh -huh. And then you have to see what those conjugacy classes are. And it turns out that those conjugacy classes are parametrizing closed geodesics when they're uh -huh. hyperbolic, and then there are parabolic ones. Those are the ones responsible for this blow up. And then there's elliptic ones uh -huh. for SL2Z. Uh -huh. And uh, his, his observation is that you should handle them separately. And when you add them all together, you get the trace point. Huh. So that's... Uh, OK. Yeah. So our, that's why this is the baby trace formula. We don't have to deal with any of these technicalities. We're not taking a limit as y goes to infinity or anything like that. But, but Selberg catches it in this lower order term. That's the, you know, the beauty of it and the difficulty of it. But it's a great argument. I, 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 can't, uh, I can't do it. Henrik's going to do it. We, we shouldn't be teaching exactly the same thing. Um, OK, other questions, comments, discussion? So, um, so the whole point of that was to, was to say, was, I, I want to do Riemann's memoir from a modern point of view. So let's do Riemann. Riemann's memoir uh, by a Tate. Okay, so we need one more thing. We need one more um, bit of preparatory uh, discussion, which is on um, Mellon transforms need one more thing, which is Mellon transforms. So what's a Mellon transform? If you have a function, it's a, tr it's a Fourier transform just on the additive 
positive, uh, sorry, the multiplicative group of positive uh, numbers. I don't know, to R, to C, whatever. Let's put it in C. So if you have a function on um, the positive reals, and of course I'm, I'm giving it a group structure, but it's just a function. The functions don't have group structure. It's Mellon transform. S is a complex number. Wherever the wherever this integral is uh, converges will make sense. I integrate this times a character y to the s with uh, you could say eigenvalue s and then har measure. So this dy over y is har measure on this group. This is a character of the group. A character because if I if I take uh, what's the group action? It's multiplication, right? So this just the fact that this is a character is just that x times y to the s is x to the s times y to the s. That's the only uh, property that I'm using there, and then, and then this is the the function itself. Okay, um, so let's see just a couple of examples. Probably most, if not all, of you have seen Mellon transforms before. Uh, what's the if I take the exponential function, so I need it to be able to converge somewhere. So at infinity, let's take it to be e to the minus y. At zero, then you have to make sure that the uh, real part of s is what? Positive, I guess. I already have, um, I already have, uh, this is really y to the s minus one. But when people write, I, I don't like it when people write y to the s minus one, because it's taking away from the fact that there's harm measure here. Yes, it's y to the s minus one when you want to do computations. Anyway. So if the real part of S is bigger than zero, then this will converge. Then we have a Fourier, uh, when we have a Mellon transform. And what is it? This integral e to the minus y, and then y to the s, dy over y. This is the I guess everybody knows, but somebody wants somebody else to say. I thought you froze for a second. Oh, I didn't freeze. Uh, it's a gamma, gamma okay. function. Thank you. Okay, so just a, an example. Uh, there's lots of others and we'll see lots of others. And so what we need is the Mellon inversion formula. Um, so theorem, Mellon inversion is that again, if, you, if this function is sufficiently nice, if f is sufficiently nice, and I leave it to you at every instance of nice to figure out what, what uh, nice means so that everything can be, um, you know, so that this argument can, can be uh, pulled through. If you take its Mellon transform and you take the opposite character and you integrate now in the s variable in the index, not in the, uh, in the geometry variable, and you integrate over a vertical line, some vertical line. So this is the vertical line, um, real part of s equals two. Two, there's nothing special about two. I just put a definite number there. It could be 10, could be 100. Uh, you have to be a little careful with negative values here, or zero for that matter, depending on where, depending on where your Mellon transform originally converges. Uh, you just want to be within that range of absolute convergence. And you multiply by 1 over 2 pi i. When you compute this integral as a function of y, you will recover f itself. Okay, let me give you uh, proof one is just, this is, this is Fourier inversion, which I'll leave as an exercise. Well, maybe I'll give you some hints to the exercise. What is the, uh, so hint, what is the Mellon transform? If I write this, uh, now if we want to think about this, sort of group theoretically, we have a group, we have a character, and we have harm measure. But so is Fourier analysis, a group, a character, and, and, and harm measure. If I make a change of variables, let's say y equals e to the u, this becomes, when y is zero, u must be negative infinity. When y is infinity, u is infinity. f of y becomes f of e to the u. 
y to the s becomes e to the us. So if s is uh, complex, then I'm then this is a kind of Fourier transform. And what's dy over y? Well, dy is e to the u du. dy is e to the u du. So dy over y is du e to the u over e to the u. Okay, so it's just a Fourier transform. All right. So once you've recognized this as a Fourier transform, you can apply a regular Fourier inversion and then work your way to this formula. But I want to give you a, a proof that I prefer. This appears in a paper of uh, Dorian Goldfeld and myself. So um, I, I want to, uh, in fact, I prefer to prove Fourier inversion through our proof first, as you'll see, because uh, it uses nothing but residue calculus. It, it's, it's an extremely basic uh, argument. So uh, why should this be true? Why should this melon inversion be true? Well, let's look at what it's what it's saying. I have this integral, I have this one over two pi i, integral over some vertical line. People like to put sigmas here, uh, sigma being some arbitrary number. I like to put two there. Two is as arbitrary a number as any other in in this uh, in this thing. Okay, the Fourier trans uh, the Mellon transform times y to the minus s ds. So let's put here the Mellon transform uh, f of some other dummy variable u u to the s du over u. And of course, it's number theory. So when, when you have something like this, it's the wrong way around. So I have an integral from 0 to infinity, f of u. And then inside is 1 over 2 pi i, an integral over some vertical line, u to the s, y to the minus s. That's u over y to the s ds du, du over u. What happened to u? Yeah, du over u. And so this thing should be a delta spike, spike at u equals y. And maybe that's good enough for physicists. And I realize I'm, I'm doing, you know, this is a crash course. I promised a crash course. So we're doing everything sort of as quickly as possible, avoiding as many technicalities as, as possible. Um, but, this, but we're going to do it, you know, a little bit more uh, rigorously than this. And uh, it's perfectly rigorous. Everything I'm doing is perfectly rigorous. It's just uh, you have to, uh, I'm not being careful about the spaces, which you can work out on your own. So I would like this to be the case, but uh, how do I actually uh, establish this? So idea, which is an idea that's going to be appearing again and again, is to use, uh, use uh, integration by parts partial integration to get more smoothness. This is not smooth enough for more smoothness. So what do I mean by this? I.e. the Mellon transform, again, is I'm just writing down the formula for it. And uh, let's make let's do integration by parts. So I want to um, so I'll write this in the wrong way as u to the s minus one du, and then I want to integrate by parts. So if I integrate by parts, there's no boundary terms. I'm assuming everything uh, you know decays. I mean f is some kind of test function. So let's say it's compact support. So there's no boundary terms. I have an integral from zero to infinity. I'll differentiate this f prime of u. I'll integrate this. The integral of u to the s minus 1, the antiderivative, is u to the s over s du. OK, so far so good. Now, if I stick that formula, if I stick this formula in here, what happens? So 1 over 2 pi i. The integral over some vertical line of the Mellon transform, which I'll use this formula for, 
times y to the minus s ds. So I have negative integral from zero to infinity, f prime of u, u to the s over s, d u, not du over u now, although I could make this an s plus one and a over u there. Let's just leave that as a, as a du. That's the uh, attempt, that's the uh, attempt at Mellon inversion. But what is this? Of course, I'm going to reverse orders. So if I reverse orders, I have negative integral from zero to infinity, f prime of u, one over two pi i, an integral over the vertical line two. Um, here I get a u over y to the s, ds over s, and then a du. Now this is very close to uh, something rigorous. Does anybody know what this integral is called? Some people call it like the Perron integral. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It, it has an, it's something that's going to come up again and again and again. Uh, let's look at, so let's isolate this. Look at this one over two pi i integral over some vertical line two x to the s ds over s. Okay, x is a real number, positive real number. So here's the complex plane. Here's the vertical line two. We're integrating over this vertical line. That's our, our, our path, our contour. Where does the function x to the s over s have poles? It's regular except at zero, thank you. So there's a pole here. And the residue, if I multiply by s and I take the limit as s goes to zero, I just get x to the zero, also known as one. Okay, so if, if x is less than, if x is, um, sorry, less than one, if x is less than one, what I wanna do is pull the contour all the way over here. So the, the, the top and the bottom will cancel out because I have a one over S. Of course, I'm, uh, I'm cheating quite a bit because this integral does not converge, absolutely. This one over S, I, I'm gonna have a lot of trouble. It, it uh, is not integral, right? Uh, it doesn't decay enough for me to be able to do a lot of the things that I'm, that I'm claiming. I'm gonna fix that in a minute. Um, so I pull the contour all the way over here to 100 and I have, x to the minus, uh, x is less than one, and I have x to the hundredth power. So that's a tiny uh, contribution. So let me leave this as an exercise to fill in the details. If x is less than one, I'm gonna get zero. What about if x is bigger than one? If x is bigger than one and I pull the contour over here, I get a number bigger than one to a huge power and spinning. But that doesn't help me. If x is bigger than one, then I take this contour and I pull it all the way back to minus 100. If I pull it back to minus 100, now I have a number bigger than one to a huge negative power. That's gonna be tiny. But in this region, I, I have a pole. And the residue, so I just recover one over two pi i, I uh, just recover the value of the residue and the value of the residue is one. So this, this function is an indicator function of whether x is bigger than one or not. In fact, this is our first hint of, um, of Mellon inversion. Uh, notice if f of u is equal to the indicator of whether u is bigger than one, um, then f tilde of u of s is an integral from zero to infinity, but it, it goes from one to infinity. f of u is just one, and then uh, u to the s du over u. And even I can evaluate this. This is u to the s minus one. The antiderivative is u to the s over s. And so this comes out to just one over S.
And so what is this? So this is just one over two pi i integral over vertical line two of f tilde of s in this case, which is one over s times x to the s ds. Okay, that's an instance of, of null inversion. Would um, it be okay for me to ask a question? Please, yes, of course. So, okay, so it seems to me that when you're doing this, like what kind of what you did is you figured out a way to calculate the Mellon inversion formula for a specific function. Yes. But then also a way to like let that become the Mellon inversion for like general functions. Yes, exactly. And so that's actually, I, I just think it's interesting because it's kind of what you do in Fourier analysis also. That's like you, you, you do something with this Dirichlet like kernel. Exactly. And then somehow that upgrades into like the full Fourier inversion formula. Yep, absolutely. There's no Mellon inversion and Fourier inversion are, are one and the same. It's just a, a change of variables. Um, this change of variables allows you to do all kinds of crazy complex analysis uh, tricks that wouldn't be possible. Uh, well, well it, I, I agree that you can get in between them using uh, this inversion or using change of variables. You can like prove one from the other. But I feel like this function that you're using, um, the like x to the s, does does that, that that's not doesn't turn into the Dirichlet kernel, does it? No, it doesn't. It's it's a slightly different. I mean, the mechanism by which the proofs work is slightly different. In that here we're doing residue calculus, which there's no analog of. Uh, well, there is there is of course a complex analytic proof of Fourier inversion also, which which will use residue calculus. But um, a sort of standard real variable, as you said, Dirichlet kernel and type. Um, this is hiding some of the same mechanisms. I don't know if that's if I don't know if it's fair to say that it's hiding it in the residue calculus, but uh, but the process is going to be very similar. And and what we're doing right now is about to fail. I mean, it's it's already uh, I'm I'm interchanging integrations with uh, something that convert that grows like one over t at infinity. And so that I can't make this uh, rigorously true, but I'm about to make it rigorously true by uh, getting a little bit more smoothness out of it. Okay, yeah, I see what you mean because when you do like Dirichlet kernel and residue calculus are both closely about integrating an exponential around a circle. Yes. So they're probably like somehow secretly the same. Yes, yes. Because she's, you yeah, you could probably calculus. translate if you really wanted to, because she's theorem into that Dirichlet integral around a circle of an exponential. Yep. That's what because she's uh, theorem is. Right, the integrator around the circle, e to the whatever, and uh, you get nothing unless there's a unless the you know one over z one over z turns into uh, integration around the circle. Anyway, great. Okay, so just to finish this uh, second mock proof, uh, when I put this back in, I have minus integral from zero to infinity f prime of u, and it's this function. It's this function at, um, uh, it's this function, uh, something here is funny. I should have a minus S here, but let's just, okay. Uh, for for Mellon inversion, I would want it to be this. There's some change of variables from, from one to the other, Never mind. This function is this function, is exactly this thing that we evaluated uh, with X replaced by U over Y. So, we know what the, uh, what the analysis will give us. It'll give us the indicator function of whether u over y is bigger than one, du. Uh, well, that's the same thing as saying instead of integrating from zero to infinity, u should integrate only from y to infinity, f prime of u du. And now the fundamental theorem applies and gives me this is it's just the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so again, it's still not uh, not rigorous. Uh, can't can't reverse orders. Can't interchange orders. Reverse orders, not uh, uh, not integrable. But the idea is there. So then, what do you do? We don't have enough decay. We got a bit of decay out of uh, partial integration, if 
but not enough. Only one over S. So do it again. Do it again. Do it again. You got one trick in this business. You want more cancer? You want more uh, decay? You're gonna grade by parts as many times as you need. Okay, so the the real proof. Now we're ready for the real proof. Is that not only is the Mellon transform equal to a single integration by parts uh, y to the s dy now over s y to the s over s dy, we do it again, again. So this minus sign becomes a plus sign. That's familiar to us. It's very good to do two integrate an even number of integration by parts. Uh, this we're going to differentiate yet again. Now I have the second derivative of, of f. This I'm going to integrate the integral of y to the s is y to the s plus one over s plus one. And I already had a one over s there, dy. Now I have quadratic decay, which is integral. This is integral. Now we can do this for real. And now you see what I need for the test function. I need it to be twice differentiable, maybe uh, compactly supported here to make things nice, or just make it decay enough down here that you can plug in various values of that. Okay. So now look at, look back at one over two pi i, an integral over a vertical line, f tilde of s, y to the s, uh, y to the minus s ds, and I'll put this in, integral from zero to infinity, f double prime, I need some other w variable that almost looks like a u anyway. That one's meant to be a y, this one's a u. Um, u to the, u to the s plus one is u times u to the s over s times s plus one, du. And now I interchange orders. Same as before, f double prime of u times u, and then all my s stuff, one over two pi i, integral over some vertical line, u to the s over y to the s, so u over y to the s, and then divided by s times s plus one, and then ds. Now this is a perfectly convergent integral. Everything, I can, I can move everything around. Everything's absolutely uh, integral. So we need to study um, what, is, what is one over two pi i, another Perron type integral. Um, integral. Uh, X to the S over S times S plus one ds. What is this? So by the same exact argument, or the same exact sketch of an argument, at least, we're integrating over this vertical line too. I have a pole at s equals zero. I have another pole at s equals one, uh, negative one, rather. At zero, my residue, what's my residue? So I multiply by s, and I take the limit as s goes to zero. I get x to the one, x to the zero over, the residue is x to the zero over zero plus one. What's the residue at negative one? This is negative one. I multiply by s plus one, and I take the limit as s goes to negative one. So I get x, the residue is x to the negative one divided by, now s is negative one. Okay. If, if x is less than one, I pull the contour over here. As before, it's nicely convergent. There's an x to a negative power. That negative power is getting larger and larger. I get nothing. If x is bigger than one, I pull the contour the other way. Again, here I get a uh, large number to a large negative power. So everything decays. And I have to just pick up the residues. This residue is one. This residue is minus one over x. Okay, pretty simple. So let's put this 
in for here. I have an integral from zero to infinity, two derivatives of u times u. And then this formula that we just worked out, it's the indicator function of x, o, x being less than one, x is u over y. So this is u being greater than y u over y being greater than one times one minus one over x, which is u over y du. Okay, and now this is very simple. I'm integrating from y to infinity, not from zero to infinity, two derivatives of u. I'm going to multiply in the u. Here I get u minus y. Du. Integrate by parts. Unintegrate by parts. Integrate by parts the other way. I get f prime of u times the derivative of this in u, which is 1. Du. And that recovers f of y. So a very, I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm motivating how, how this proof is found, not just uh, the proof itself, right? It should be a delta function, but you can't quite make it a delta function. But if you integrate by parts once, it almost feels like it sh everything should work, except you can't make the integrals actually interchange rigorously. So you just do it one more. And uh, now you have quadratic decay. There's no problem with any of these integrals. And, uh, and you get your form. Okay, smoothness to the rescue. All right. Um, what can I do in 15 minutes? I don't want to get stuck in the middle of a proof again. Maybe there's nothing I can do but get stuck in the middle of a proof. Ah, let's do, well, let's do one little exercise in before we go to uh, Riemann's memoir, which is combining exactly these two things, Mellon, uh, Mellon transforms and uh, Poisson summation. Let's do a little bit more on Poisson summation just uh, as, a, as a setup for, to set up Riemann's memoir. We're almost there to set up Riemann's memoir. Um, uh, what am I about to say? Yeah, let's play with Poisson summation. Play with Poisson summation in the following way. Um, if, uh, if I set f sub t of x to be f of x times t. So this is, again, the, the regular representation of, so t is a positive number. Let's, let's say t is in the group r positive, the multiplicative group of positive reals. So then this is the regular representation What does the regular representation do? It just multiplies in a t. That's how it acts on, on this space. Um, anyway, I, again, I'm trying to plant some seeds that, that will be hopefully uh, useful later. So if this is f, um, let's make this an exercise. It's a very easy exercise. Exercise, show that it, the Fourier transform of ft of x, of whatever, c, I like to use see here, is uh, 1 over t times the original Fourier transform, not xc, but xc over t. Okay, this is a very simple uh, exercise, just to change your variables. So what, how does um, Poisson summation read now? So Poisson summation now looks like this, a sum on one hand of ft of n, n in z, is equal to a sum over m in z, uh, ft hat of m, which is, uh, we just said, ft hat is 1 over t, f hat of m over t, if this is a sum over n in z, um, f of n t. So this formula, the first time you see this formula, it sort of doesn't make, it's, it's not 
the significance of it is, is hard to maybe uh, grasp. Here we have a, a sum where there's a t, a positive real number t, that's sort of stretching the, the function. Here, the Fourier transform is getting compressed and, and also uh, spiked, if you think of t as being large. My favorite way to, to think about this is um, to take an explicit example. Uh, let f of x be the Gaussian, e to the minus pi x squared. This is the Gaussian. This is the correct Gaussian. Some people put, uh, you know, twos or something and one over root two pi and all this nonsense. No, no, this is the Gaussian. Uh, why is this the Gaussian? Because then, let's make this another exercise. Test your uh, Fourier analysis. The Fourier transform of the Gaussian is literally itself with no constants, not, nothing else. Okay. So then what does this formula read in this case? It says, so, so plus on summation tells us that a sum over the integers of f, f is the Gaussian, e to the minus pi, n squared, t squared, is equal to one over t, a sum over the integers of also the Gaussian, e to the minus pi, m squared, over t squared. Okay, let's take t equals, I don't know, uh, let's make t equal to a, a tenth or something, one over a, one over a hundred. So this exponential function obviously is decaying very rapidly. And uh, as soon as the, this exponent is, you know, at least 10 or something. So this has almost no contribution once, uh, let's say, pi n squared t squared is, is of size 10. And so if t is of size 1 over 100, this is roughly, roughly when n, so let's see, when n is at least, let's, let's call these, let's call pi n 10 equal to 1, roughly uh, bigger than 1 over t. 1 over t is 100. Okay, an absolute value. So we have like 100 terms on either side, and then there's no more contribution. It's bounded by e to the you know, minus uh, 10 or something. And e to the minus 10 is a, is a tiny, tiny number. Okay, so there's almost no contribution. So, so this side, uh, once you sum 100 terms, once you sum 100 terms, you know this thing to you know, 10, 20 decimal places or something. Uh, stop. How about on this side? On this side, I have pi divided by t squared. t squared is, uh, so divided by t squared, that's 100 squared. That's 100 squared times m squared. If m is equal to 1, this, there's no, there's nothing. There's nothing here. There's only, the only term contributes here. So the only term uh, here that contributes is m equals zero. That's it. After that, it's just a flat line. And, uh, and, and the value is one over t at m equals zero, because this, this has value one. And one over t is 100. So you could evaluate you know, 201 terms, if you want to know this, and you'll get a really good estimate for this. Or you could come here and evaluate one term, the m equals zero term, and you're immediately at, at 100. So um, that's really sort of the, the power of uh, Poisson summation. And we're going to use exactly this. So we're going to come back to exactly this formula um, next time. Um, I don't think it's worthwhile to start playing with this now because everything that I need to set up with it, I need to be loaded into your brains to be, uh, for it to be useful. So um, maybe let's stop here. I went over last time a couple of minutes, so I'll go under a couple of minutes. So I have a question. Please. Uh, so the Fourier transform of the 
Gaussian as itself, right? So yes. um, if you change variables and you make that a statement about like melanin version, is there any, is there, is that kind of an interesting identity? Uh, we are going to see that. That's exactly what, um, so Riemann used explicit functions. He didn't use, I mean, he used Poisson summation, but he applied Poisson summation to the explicit function, which uh -huh. was a Gaussian type. Uh -huh. And as a result, he, he, and for the next 50 years, people didn't, uh, for, for the next 100 years, 90 years, people didn't see that this is a basic mechanism having nothing to do with special functions. It's not about uh -huh. gamma. It's not about Gaussian. It's just Poisson summation. So that's exactly what we're going to, this is Tate's uh, major, uh, of course, he also did this adelically, but uh, as far as I know, the first person to make this observation is really, or, or put it in the, in the foreground is, is Tate, put it front and center. Yeah, it seems like everyone has a different concept of what Tate's thesis is. Ha. Because, because they, the people like put, put different aspects of it into the forefront. Absolutely, absolutely. So he does this adelically. And because he does it adelically, uh, he figured, I mean, you could say he figures out what the analogs of gamma and, and the Gaussian are adelically, you know, at, at each of the places. But really what he, uh, what he recognizes is the role of Poisson summation, the adelic Poisson summation. And so I'm not, uh, I want to keep everything sort of, I want to move uh, very quickly onto other topics. So I'm, I'm not going to touch the Adels, but uh, the fact that Poisson summation, yes, over the Adels. So people will say Tate's thesis introduced Adels into this theory for the first time, as, as absolutely it did. Uh, but it also introduced Poisson summation as the fundamental um, operation. Would you say, George, or you have uh, you have something else in mind for? Oh no, I think you're absolutely right, and yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And 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 I get when I was first learning this subject, I was always a little bit uh, confused because some people were emphasizing the Adels more, and some people were emphasizing the like arbitrary test function. And it's really that he did both things, and the thesis he did both is like things. very yeah. rich and I. I would say because he decided to work over the Adels, he had to give up special functions and it allowed him to recognize the fundamental role played by Poisson summation. So I think it is the Adels that motivated, um, motivated him to discover this way of thinking about Riemann's memoir. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. So it also reminds me of a time I asked you uh, about um, using different test functions to make things that look like beta functions. Uh huh. Because I was I was thinking about that and I was I was trying to imagine you know like there's a whole space of functions that are their own Fourier transform, right? Yeah. Um, and some yeah, of them, that's... some of the explicit ones are really nice. You know, you take the Gaussian and you modify it with these like orthogonal polynomials and things like that. Yes, and then you showed me the calculation, uh, right? That you could do the whole thing with an arbitrary test function. Exactly. Um, so it's it's not really so much about like the specific shape of exactly. the function. It's really like the 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 machine of the harmonic analysis, I guess. Exactly, and that's exactly. So this is where we're going to start next time. Is uh, take this formula, massage it just a little bit, hit it with Poisson summation, hit it with uh, Millen transform in the t variable. We have everything in place, uh, and then we'll out, out will pop uh, an uncountably many functional equations for the zeta function. One for every test function. Another thing I think is really cool about this presentation is that you sort of emphasized the actual computational aspect of it. Like if you wanted to calculate this function, you would use the you choose the right side of of Poisson summation. And that was something that was definitely in the forefront of Riemann's mind because he didn't have computers. Like if he wanted to know what something equals, which he did, he would do it out with decimals. And he was using Poisson summation to make that more efficient, I think. Absolutely. And, and so- Absolutely. This, yeah. And of course, there's dualizing ideas everywhere in modern analytic number theory that you go, any, anytime you have uh, some kind of you know, dual sum, if this, if this sum is, if the dual sum is shorter, switch to the dual sum.
This is the whole AB process. You dualize, then you truncate, then you dualize, then you truncate, and so on. Um, absolutely. I guess another kind of interesting thing, too, um, is that you know, uh, there's kind of like a multiplicative additive mixing going on, right? Because the the plus on summation is really something with like additive characters, right? But when you do these um, dilation, like this dilation calculation, that's kind of like a multiplicative thing. Uh huh. Um, I don't really know if it's like of the same flavor as like because uh, sometimes you see that, right? Like going between um, like the Dirichlet series and the Euler product or something like that, you get kind of like that. Yeah, there's that this Heisenberg effect. group in the background, I think. What's that? There's this like Heisenberg group in the background that that's, I guess, like the mechanism for mixing these two additive and multiplicative structures. Yeah, right. Um, I always kind of get excited when I see that because that sort of seems to be something very much about number theory, right? Like if you were just a algebraist, algebraist, you would uh, you have like one ring operation, or well, I guess rings have two. <laughs> Maybe I'm meeting my words as I'm saying that. But I guess like it sort of usually seems focused on like one algebraic operation, and you should do all the transformations in terms of it. But like uh, I don't know, Poisson summation feels very additive to me, and and Mellon transform feels very multiplicative. So. And what you're about to do is to put them together, right? So exactly, exactly. That's kind of weird, right? To like take a you're saying that these two things are same under a var variable change. So they kind of that maybe makes you think that they live in two different places. But you're kind of, you're about to put them together, right? So yeah. Yeah, it, it's I mean, it's uh I guess I think of it a little bit like what I said up here about this. Um the group that's acting on the space of real valued functions, all of R, is the multiplicative group of positive reals. So it's like F uh, will take any uh, real input, but uh, the, the representation that I want to act on is the, is the dilation operation, which only I'll only allow positive reals, which act as a group under multiplication. So I think that's... Uh, yeah, what, what's the line? Uh, Goldbach is a stupid conjecture. You're not supposed to add primes. You're supposed to multiply them. So it's this mix of uh, additive and multiplicative that makes things difficult or interesting. It's also like how bilinear forms work, right? It's, it's how bilinear forms work. It's how, um, it's how uh, the sum product theorems work. Mixing ad addition and multiplication. And uh, all the GL2 stuff, right? Like, I guess that's sort of like what George is saying, right? All the, you have like uh, the, what is it? N, the Iwasawa, N-A-K, right? And A is really like a multiplicative thing and N is additive. Right. Uh, I, I want to add to, to, to this. I mean, you said that they live in different like spaces, F and F hat. And uh, I think it, it, it is true. I mean, when you see this uh, box, that the professor has drawn. You might not see it, but if you look at the full Poisson, not Poisson summation, but if you write the whole thing down, look, sum n in z f of x plus n is equal to this sum f hat e two pi i uh -huh. x. Then you would see that, you know, they are different. Like, I don't know, I, I feel if you hide this, if you just plug in x equals zero, you might think that they live in the same thing, but no, like, I, I think it's, they don't live. <laughs> Yeah, so, so that's even the next stage is to do twisted Poisson summation where you completely clearly see an, a multiplicative character here and then a finite sum. So that multiplicative character is getting hit by every integer n. And here there's a finite sum over the other characters and then an additive, right? This is what comes out of uh, Gauss sum, a Gauss sum com computation that the dual to this multiplicative is an additive operation with a sum over the other character is mod Q. Right, Gauss sums are the same thing. Additive exactly. Or exactly. the gamma function or... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the gamma function you can see is the same thing except exponentiated. So uh, you're mixing, where, where's the gamma function? 
here. You're mixing something that's a, an additive character with something that's a multiplicative character. E to the minus y is an additive character. Y to the s is a multiplicative character. So you have them at the same plane at the same time. 